Should I start? Sure. Lord. Welcome everyone to this congressional briefing on India's abuse of anti-terror law to suppress free speech. This is the second congressional briefing in our alternate Wednesday series. I'm Sunita Vishwanath, co-founder of Hindus for Human Rights. Earlier this month, the High Court in India's capital, New Delhi, created international news by letting, on, letting off on bail three university students, including two women who had been arrested last year under a draconian anti-terrorism law. In its release order, the High Court said, and I quote, it seems that in its anxiety to suppress dissent in the mind of the state, the line between the constitutionally guaranteed right to protest and terrorist activity seems to be getting somewhat blurred. If this mindset gains, gains traction, it would be a sad day for democracy. This powerful ruling, sadly, is a rare occurrence in today's India. The grim reality is that India's criminal justice system, encompassing the law enforcement agencies, the police, as well as the specialized anti-terror national investigation agency or NIA, the prosecution and the courts have collectively condemned thousands of innocent citizens to incarceration by invoking the, the draconian terror laws against them. These imprisoned victims include some of India's most prominent lawyers, journalists, social and political activists, intellectuals, authors, and of course, Muslims, who are India's largest religious minority group and are currently the biggest target of India's Hindu nationalist government. Our panelists today will cover the span of how these terror laws are being abused in India. The law of choice for this abuse is the UAPA, the Unlawful Activities Prevention Act, which was first enacted in 1967, but has subsequently been made more and more stringent. Before I call upon our first speaker, I would like to thank all the US-based partner organizations that have worked so hard to organize this congressional briefing. Amnesty International USA, 21 Wilberforce, Hindus for Human Rights, that's my organization, Indian American Muslim Council, International Christian Concern, Jubilee Campaign, Dalit Solidarity Forum, New York State Council of Churches, Federation of Indian American Christian Organizations of North America, India Civil Watch International, Students Against Hindutva Ideology, Justice for All, Center for Pluralism, American Muslim Institution, International Security for Peace and Justice, and Association of Indian Muslims of America. As you listen to the presentations, if you have questions, please type them in the chat. And if we have time at the end, I will take them one by one with the speakers. Please keep your questions brief and direct them to one speaker if possible. And so we go on to hear from our esteemed speakers. First, I'm honored to introduce our keynote speaker, Indra Jaising who is a renowned and veteran lawyer from India practicing law at India's Supreme Court for decades. She is also a former additional solicitor general of India. Ms. Jay Singh is also widely noted for her legal activism in promoting human rights causes. In 2018, she was ranked 20th in the list of 50 greatest leaders of the world by the US-based Fortune magazine. She is a co-founder of Lawyers Collective, a nonprofit organization that promotes human rights, especially on issues relating to women's rights, HIV, tobacco, LGBTQ issues, and parliamentary corruption in India. Ms. Jay Singh too is a victim of the Indian government's witch hunt. Not only has the government filed a case personally against Ms. Jay Singh, it has also criminally charged lawyers collective with a false allegation of violating financial rules concerning foreign funding. It is incredibly inspiring, a testament to who she is and what she stands for, that she speaks today with us in spite of the dangers involved. 
She joins us from Delhi where it is late evening and so she will have to leave a little early. Indraji, you have 12 minutes to speak to us. I welcome Indraji Singh. Thank you, Sunita, for that uh, very glowing introduction. Uh, let me come straight to the point. Um, I thank you for this opportunity for saying a few words on India's anti-terror laws. I'll try to be as brief and as precise as possible. Um, well, um, there is something that distinguishes anti-terror laws from ordinary criminal law. And uh, what we are concerned about in India today is that this difference between anti-terror laws and ordinary laws is being collapsed. Uh, in my opinion, the main reason for collapsing these laws is to keep people under trials behind bars for indefinite periods of time, because these anti-terror laws contain very stringent provisions for the grant of bail, which I will deal with at the present moment. So we are talking about nothing less than the very heart and soul of the rule of law, which says that we are all presumed innocent until proved guilty. There is no universally accepted definition of what is terrorism worldwide. What we have is sectoral resolutions of the United Nations, which deal with, say, hijacking of aircrafts or terrorism of ships or terrorism against nuclear establishment, but no clear definition of what is meant by terrorism. As I understand it, the offense of terrorism consists of an act of intimidation, which is intended to make governments do or not do things which are illegal by violent means, the impact of which is felt on ordinary citizens. But as I said, there is no definition that I've been able to lay my hands on. Let me talk about India's anti-terror laws. The hallmark of India's anti-terror laws is that they deny to an under trial the right to bail. And this means that if a trial goes on for 10 years, 14 years, 15 years, a person accused of terrorism who might ultimately be acquitted can be put away behind bars for that long. A few examples which I will deal with presently will suffice to make this point. But for the moment, I wish to point out that India doesn't have, for example, a law such as Mirandizing the accused. The police are not obliged to tell an accused that they don't have to make a statement to the police and that they have a right against self-incrimination. And this often leads to confessions being forced from those who are accused of terrorism. Now, what is it about these terrorist laws that makes it so easy for governments and prosecutors and the police to accuse people of terrorism in the first place? It is the overbroad definition of what is a terrorist act. And this is what Sunita pointed out too, at the very commencement of these proceedings, that the Delhi High Court has said, you are basically using an anti-terror law to deal with your dissenters. Why does it happen? It happens because the definition of an, a terrorist act is overbroad. Let me just tell you how it's defined under Indian law. Uh, it says, uh, whoever does anything with intent to threaten or which is likely to threaten, mark these words, please, the unity, integrity, security, sovereignty of India with intent to strike terror or likely to strike terror in the people or any section of the people commits a terrorist act with lethal weapons, which is likely to cause death or causes death. Now, if you see the two most prominent cases going on in India today, one is what has come to be known as the Delhi riots case, and the other is the Pima Koregaon case you will find that in both of them, there is no allegation against the accused 
that they attacked the sovereignty, the unity, the territorial integrity, or the security of India. At best, the allegations against them were of being part of a riot in which people lost their lives. Now, I have been saying repeatedly, and I'll say it again, every riot is an offense, but not every riot is an act of terrorism. And yet, this law is invoked when there is violence, when there is a riot. Yes, we know that the Indian Penal Code can be invoked. We know, for example, that charges of murder can be brought, but not charges of terrorism. And that is because I told you the only reason to do that is to keep these people behind bars because bail cannot be granted, pre-trial bail. So our attack in India has been against this provision of law, which says that pre-trial bail cannot be granted unless an accused person shows that there is reason to believe that he or she is not guilty. Now that's like asking me to prove that I'm not guilty, whereas we know that the burden of proof is on the prosecution and that we are entitled to the presumption of innocence. So this is, I would say it goes to the heart of what we call the rule of law in this country. Now, let me illustrate this with these two cases I talked about in the Delhi riots case. What were these young people protesting against? They were protesting against the Citizenship Amendment Act. The Citizenship Amendment Act is highly discriminatory. It offers a fast track to citizenship to those who were illegal migrants, but only if they belong to the Hindu community or are Buddhist, Jains, or Christians. It denies the same privilege to Muslims. And this is an act which created nationwide protests. And these young people that Sunita mentioned were arrested under anti-terror laws for protesting against this law where there was violence. Now there was no link between them and the violence, except that it was alleged against them that they had organized protests. This is why the judgment of the Delhi High Court that Sunita talked about made international headlines, because the judgment said you cannot invoke an anti-terror law against those who are protesting, even if the protest leads to violence. Let's be very clear over here. Protest plus violence does not e equal to terror. And therefore, the anti-terror laws cannot be invoked. Why is it? Because these protests were not targeted against the sovereignty of India. They were not targeted against the unity of India. They were not targeted against the security of India. They were protests against the law which these people considered unconstitutional. And if I may say so, I do consider these laws unconstitutional and petitions are pending in court. But there's no law which says that you cannot protest against a law simply because a petition is pending in court. Let me take the second example, Bhima Korega. It's laughable that the objections against them in a solemn chart sheet filed in court is that they recited a poem by Bertrand Brecht at what has come to be known as the Elkar Parishad. They organized a Parishad. A Parishad is a congregation. It's a Congress of people who get together for a discussion and for furthering their own political point of view. And at this meeting, which was, by the way, organized by a former judge of the Supreme Court of India and a former judge of the High Court, one of the participants recited a poem of Bertrand Brecht, in which he said that wherever there is oppression, there should be rebellion. Now this, which was a poetic way of saying we must all protest oppression, was taken to be an act of terrorism. So there you go, two examples where there is no attack on the sovereignty of India, no attack on the security of the state, and yet this law has been invoked. Now why does this happen? It happens because our government has collapsed the difference between 
a disagreement with the policy of the government of India and an attack on the Indian state. It is like saying the government for the time being is India and India is the government or even worse, uh, a particular minister in the government of India is India and India is a particular minister in the government of India. You simply cannot collapse these differences. There's an amazing confusion of thought over there, which is intended to keep these people behind bars. The other strategies that are used is invoking sedition. We still have a law of sedition in India, which has no business to be in a, a law in a, in a democratic republican form of government. Yet another strategy which is used is to invoke a law which says uh, nothing should be done to create communal disharmony. I would like to say a few words about this. Here it is. If a minority community organizes itself and says, we are being targeted by the majority community. They will be held responsible for creating communal disharmony because this government doesn't recognize the difference between a minority and a majority. We are all one, regardless of our ethnicity, regardless of our religious beliefs, we are all supposed to be one Hindu nation. And that's really the root of the problem, the refusal to accept that we are a country with plural religions, all of which have a right to thrive in India. And therefore these laws, which are intended to protect minorities are being used against minorities. Yet I was asked to say a few words about the modus operandi. I've said, I've, I've explain to you how anti-terror laws are used. But here are a few more strategies that are used against minority communities and against dissenters. Multiple crimes. Indraji, you have about one minute left. Sorry. Yes, I will finish by just mentioning another three or four modus operandi is being used. One of them is when a person is about to be released on pretrial bail, a new crime is registered against them. We call this evergreening of a crime. And therefore, there's no hope that you will ever be able to get out while trials are going on. Yet another strategy that is being used is you simply change the goalpost. And I'm going to end over here by giving you a couple of examples. While we were protesting the abrogation of Section 370, of the Constitution of India, which gave the state of Jammu and Kashmir a special status. They simply amended the law by saying that instead of consulting the state government, we need to consult the governor. And the government, it was president's rule at that time. So it was like the government of India taking permission from itself to alter the special status of the state of Jammu and Kashmir and they just did it overnight by a simple notification, a presidential order. So there you are changing the goalpost, changing the law through delegated legislation, through rules, through regulations, while the protest against these laws is still on. I'll stop here because what I have tried to do is outline for you the various strategies that are used. The end game of all of this is to crush all forms of defense, all, for, all forms of protest. And as Sunita pointed out to you, I am also one of the victims of this end game, except that we refuse to keep quiet and go away. Uh, but I'd like to tell you that every law has been weaponized, whether it's the Foreign Contribution Act, we had contributions from Ford Foundation and from Open Society, and we've been told that we are corrupt, we've been told that we've laundered money, we've been told that we've violated the Foreign uh, Contribution Act. Income Tax Act has been weaponized, the Mon Money Laundering Act has been, you name it, and any law is used to crush dissent. Thank you for listening to me patiently. Thank you. Thank you so much, Indraji, for your powerful words and for your courage in continuing to speak, continuing to fight. We in the diaspora get so much inspiration and we stand with you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Ritesh Dubey, who also joins us from New Delhi for and for whom it's also late evening. Thanks again, um, 
Ritesh. Mr. Dubey is a defense attorney who last year represented Safura Zargar, who is in the audience with us, I'm so happy to say. She is a, um, uh, uh, Safura is a young Muslim leader who was arrested under the absurd and false charges of conspiracy behind mass violence against Muslims in the Indian capital of Delhi. Mr. Dubey has appeared at the trial and appeals courts in New Delhi and in the so-called Delhi riots conspiracy case. He represents several other victims of this ghastly crime. This entire case is built upon the UAPA as Indra Jay Singh was just telling us. Mr. Dubey holds an LLM degree from the University of Delhi. He has completed his research in analysis of law using semiotics. Ritesh, you have six minutes. I'm sorry, uh, I didn't realize I was on mute. I'm saying thank you so much for the introduction and it's really a privilege to speak after uh, Ms. Uh, after Indira ma'am. Uh, we have all been always looking up to her uh, in, as, as young lawyers and activists. Uh, I totally agree with uh, uh, Indira ma'am on the points that she has raised on UAPA. However, I would like to go at a much abstract level of the UAPA as to what does UAPA actually stand for and does and why is it that even after since 1967 it still continues to stand in the law books despite the fact that Indian Supreme Court so to say has a very progressive image. So uh, at, at present UAPA has has become the primary arsenal in the hands of Indian state. However, it is equally fallacious to assume that it is the Indian state that is responsible for such a predicament. The nature and the spirit of the law itself makes it a useful tool for anyone who wishes to use it against anyone. So it doesn't matter whether it is a conservative right-wing government or a centrist government or a ultra-left or a left government. No government anywhere in this country, I mean, just imagine Kerala is supposed to be a, a, a state ruled by communists, but we see a lot of cases of UAPA coming from Kerala. So it is, it is actually ideologically agnostic because the law itself is framed in a manner which, is, which will and always uh, criminalize associations and speech. Indian state does not have a very satisfactory history as regards to freedom of speech. It is a very fascinating fact that in the very first year of the enactment of the constitution, in the constitution faced its first amendment restricting the circumference of the free speech. So, and Supreme Court of India has borrowed the Brandenburg test from US, which the test itself is not very good. It's a very problematic and loaded test because it paints all speech as speech worthy of protection, does not go into the normativity of various kinds of speech and what speech should be protected and what should not be protected. However, taking such a problematic test and then applying it in Indian context without giving it much proper thought has led to a situation where Supreme Court has consistently, has always and consistently shied away from declaring any of anti from the from uh, declaring any of the laws which proscribe associations and criminalize speech as unconstitutional it was never it, it was never done in case of uapa it was never done in case of tada it was never done in case of quota all these laws were allowed to be lapsed or amended by the parliament or legislature court. so we see a clear attempt by the Indian state to refuse to recognize speech and expression as a means of assertion of political sentients and paint it as a criminal activity by using tropes like national security, increasing terrorism, and more recently, a very funny ground like embarrassment to the current Indian prime minister. That's actually the charge, that's actually the statement in the charge sheet that has been filed in the court by the police that this protest organized by the, uh, by the anti-CAA activists were primarily done to embarrass uh, the current Indian Prime Minister and the Home Minister. Now something 
I mean, I don't want to get into the those people, but anyway, so the genesis of the law and the law itself is that that it cannot sustain. It should not be allowed to sustain in the law books because it is designed to pros. It is just designed to penalize free speech, and that can be any speech. I do not make any distinction between secessionist speech or terrorist activity or whatever because. those are very artificial distinctions secession i mean uh, us a great us scholar ram kushal has written a great book which is called constitutional right to secede why is secession not a uh, not recognized as a as a legitimate political demand it's a political demand the answer should come in form of a political answer or a political solution not a law and order problem so what uapa does is it simply criminalizes any political demand or any speech and makes it into a law and order problem the entire context of the speech goes away now nobody is concerned about what is the what were the students protesting about what were the bhima koregaon people protesting about everyone wants to know why did that violence happen and who is supposed to be the guilty one So you Rikish, I need you to wrap up. Sorry. Yep. Yeah. So that's the only thing uh, about UAP. I would like to say in uh, in during the uh, in my trial uh, in my trial experience uh, while representing Ms. Zergar, as uh, Ma'am Ma Jaising pointed out, we faced all of those problems, uh, case after case uh, being registered. In Delhi riots conspiracy case, a uh, UAP was invoked specially when the judge asked the police to give a detailed account. of what is the role of safura and why uh, was ms zargar uh, being charged so instead of giving a detailed reply and delineating the role of the accused the police chose to invoke uapa because that would make the court uh, that would make the bail application go out of the jurisdiction of the court and it will then obviously the bail becomes almost next to impossible to get so so the use of uapa and uh, clearly specifies and clearly shows us uh, why such a law can should not be allowed to uh, sustain in law books thank you thank you so much um for your comments today and also your important work to uh support represent political prisoners in india I really appreciate your being with us and to our audience please stay until the end because at the end we'll be showing um a 5 minute interview with um Mr. Dubey's clients of Razarkar. So I hope you'll all stay and listen to that. Um our third speaker today is Dr. Varis Hussain who speaks to us in his capacity as an adjunct professor of international law at the Howard University School of Law. Dr. Hussain is a human rights attorney working in Washington DC and has assisted several individuals facing sedition and UAPA charges in India. He is a former policy analyst for the USERF or United States Commission on International Religious Freedom when he had extensively covered the escalating religious violence and persecution in India he holds a JD LLM and doctoral legal degree in comparative constitutional law Dr Hussain is also associated with the American Bar Association Faris you have 6 minutes Thank you Sunita um and thank you to Ajit and the IAMC and Hindus for Human Rights for organizing this today as well as all of the really great work they do briefing policymakers inside of Washington DC on on being sensitive towards the issues that are emerging in India. Um I think what I want to start off by saying is that I think all of us in this room uh who care about human rights in India owe a great debt to Indira Jai Singh and the Lawyers Collective. They act as one of the only shields against constant barrage of attacks on human rights communities in India, and the work they do is beyond brave and is also incredibly necessary. So thank you, uh, Ms. Jai Singh, for that. And just as she said, when it comes to India's anti-terror laws, the process is the punishment. If that makes sense to everyone in the in the um, chat and, and who's watching, the process can go on because the Indian legal system is. is has a lot of backlogs has a lot of delays and so in and of itself the process by instigating a UAPA charge against someone not granting them pretrial bail and keeping them in jail for up to 2 to 3 years in some instances without having even an initial trial hearing is the whole point of the UAPA right 
Um, and so that's something that we have to keep in mind as we're going through this analysis of the UAPA, the processes of punishment. Additionally, I think defense attorneys like Mr. Dubey, who, who I've had the pleasure of, of working with, uh, and Safura uh, Zarver are, you know, in equal measures, courageous and tenacious um, in a way that I can't even imagine. So anything we can do to try and help facilitate the work they do is, is incredibly important. And I'm glad to see that Safura is, is out of jail and able to attend events like this and, and be able to offer her voice uh, as a victim of, of these, of these anti-terror laws. So my comments today are gonna be brief. I'm gonna target the Capitol Hill folks on this call because I wanna reflect the experience that I had on the Hill. So we have two experts who know exactly what's happening in India. They told you from a legal perspective what's happening. But what I wanna talk to you all about um, is that there are two major points that are raised whenever a congressperson's office considers raising issues or critiques of human rights practices in India. Two things. One, we shouldn't do this. We shouldn't raise any critique because India is one of our most dependable security allies in Asia. Okay, that's the first thing, right? Two, India has historically had an independent judiciary. So there, if there's a, a, a acts that are happening from the government, the, the, they have a judiciary that can act as a stopgap to stop human rights abuses um, from taking place. I wanna break down both of these presumptions for you because I know that this is gonna be something that you have to deal with internally in your offices oftentimes, whether it's State Department or whether it's on the Hill, that these two ideas are something that always comes up, right? As a stoppage so that we don't raise these issues with our Indian counterparts. Let's break down number one. Uh, we shouldn't raise or critique India's uh, use of UAPA or other things uh, because India is a security partner of ours. So we can't afford to do that. So I think one of the things to remember and this is what we always have to remember is that countries who misuse their anti-terrorism laws can not by their very nature be a dependable security ally. Let me say that one more time. Countries that are abusing anti-terrorism laws, right, cannot become a security ally you can rely on. And the reason, and why is this, right? When a security structure of a country, when it comes to the national investigatory agencies, the FBI of India or other agencies, they have a limited amount of time and resources, right? And if they're dedicating that time and resources to going after hounding, uh, making the lives of human rights activists difficult, uh, civil rights activists difficult, if they're using the anti-terrorism structure of that country um, to go after those people, they're by that very nature, not going to be able to help you on your international security, right? They're not going to be uh, by their very nature able to even act on the underlying security threats that they face as a country because they're distracted. They're doing things that they shouldn't be doing. And that's why uh, the misuse of the UAPA law goes directly to something that your offices are going to be discussing all the time. Well, India is a security partner. Exactly. If India is a security partner that you need to rely on, then you must impress upon them the importance of not abusing these kinds of laws because they cannot then be a very good ally for you or a dependable ally for you when it comes to security. So that's the first thing I want to raise when it comes to the misuse of the UAPA. Now let's go to the second defense. And I'm going quickly because I have a short period of time and I don't want Sunita to get mad at me. Okay. Second defense, right? Uh, uh, that India has an independent judiciary. I think as a comparative constitutional lawyer, right, and having done my doctoral thesis on comparing the constitutions and the judiciaries of India, uh, Pakistan, and the United States, I can tell you that historically there is some truth to that. The Indian judiciary has in the past had very activist periods, right? But I think that the judiciary operates on a pendulum. So it swings from restraint into activism depending on what's happening around them, right, or what pressure is being applied to them. So in the past, yes, we've had a judiciary that passed very brave decisions that protected the human rights of all individuals in India and did so in a very aggressive manner. There are also times when we're in a regressive trend, when the court is less active, is less independent to check the abuses of human rights that take place from the ruling administration. And that's where we are in this current period, in my humble opinion, right? Today, we're seeing the judicial authorities, and that's not just judges. This is the whole criminal uh, justice apparatus that includes the police, that includes the prosecutors, that includes the federal investigatory agencies, um, complying, all of them complying with a problematic strategy of a ruling government to silence dissent and diminish the right to free speech and other civil political rights is by its very nature, not independent, is by its very nature, not going to be able to stop or not step up uh, in the ways we need them to perhaps in the international community to act as a stopgap against these attempts uh, by the government. Perhaps now 
is the time when the judiciary needs to be the most active, right? To stunt the ability of the ruling government to suppress the exercise of human rights in the country. And we've seen that from the Delhi High Court, which recently passed a very interesting and, and important decision that says the UAPA is perhaps being overused and misused in many ways. That's great. That's one step in the right direction. We need the Supreme Court. We need the other judicial institutions to also um, remember their past as a very active judiciary, swing that pendulum back and act as a stopgap and check. And for one of those things that, that they need, right? Judges need this, prosecutors need this, other individuals need this. They need countervailing support, right? So if there's pressure being put on them by bad actors who are trying to engage in a certain kind of policy to shut down human rights activism, to shut down the free speech, then the international community that includes your offices, congressional offices, the State Department needs to apply countervailing pressure to say, we're encouraging you, right, on our end from the international side, that you should step up to exactly the reputational value that the Indian judiciary enjoys and step up to act against these things, right? Because we can apply alternate encouragement if they're getting pressure to act in a way that might be compliant with the government's attempts to shut down free speech. So my ask for all of you in this call today from the State Department and from the Hill is to consider these two points that, you know, a, a country that's misusing its anti-terrorism laws really can't be a great security partner for you. So by leaving this uh, vacuum there and not discussing it or critiquing it, you're missing an opportunity to create a better relationship as a security partner. And two, we do have an independent judiciary in the history of India, but perhaps it swings back and forth. And so so right now, because of the pressure being applied on different judicial authority forces by the ruling government who's trying to suppress human rights and free speech, we in the international community should be standing up in support of an independent judiciary in India um, to step up to its reputational value that, that it has enjoyed in the past. That's where I'll leave my comments and I'll turn it back over to Sunita. I hope I was within my six minutes. I know I rushed, sorry everyone, but uh, I wanted to get through those two points. Thank you, Varis, you were just about just about um, on time. Um, I want to thank you for bringing back the presentations we had from India to the to this context of what U.S. lawmakers should be thinking about and what the ask is of them. That's really great. Thanks. Um, our fourth speaker um, is Dr. Mayur Suresh, who is a senior lecturer in law at SOAS University of London and has joined us from London. He has also authored a book titled Terrorists, and that's in quotes, on trial, life and law in Delhi's courts, which is being published by Fordham University Press. It is based on ethnographies of terrorism trials in Delhi and looks at how people accused of terrorist crimes navigate the trial court process. In a milieu replete with instances of violence, Fabricated evidence and flimsy prosecutions, the book seeks to understand how those accused of terrorism understand the law to make their lives possible as their trials grind for years through the judicial process. He's also published articles in academic and non-academic venues about how India's anti-terror laws extract a heavy human cost and undermine India's commitment to the rule of law and constitutionalism. Mayurji, you have six minutes. Uh, thank you so much, Sunita, and thank you um, for inviting me to this event. Um, I, I just want to briefly outline the ways in which the provision of the, um, the current anti-terror law, that's the UAPA, enables the central government, um, or in the US would be called the federal government, to ban organizations as unlawful association and to designate organizations as terrorist organizations. In doing so, I will outline how this broad and unchecked power is used by the central government has impacted both on the right to freedom of association and the right to freedom of speech and expression. And through my fieldwork and some of the terrorism cases, I will show that how the police um, and prosecution attempt to use speech acts to bring charges of membership of terrorist organizations. Um, I have one minute less than I thought I had, so I'll, 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 you have my written comments, so I'll just skip over this bit. But briefly to say that the current anti-terrorism law allows, um, criminalizes um, uh, membership of a terrorist organization or a banned unlawful association. Um, it has two ways to ban associations. Uh, one way is under section three of the act, um, under which this, the, the central government can declare an association as unlawful. Um, and membership of an unlawful association um, carries, a, carries a punishment of up to two years imprisonment. Um, this is a slightly more judicially checked uh, power in the sense that once, a, once a, the government bans an association, it must make a reference to an independent, independent tribunal, which can cancel or approve the government notification. 
The second way is completely unchecked. Um, and this is through the ability of the central government to designate um, uh, an organization as a terrorist organization under Section 35 of the UAPA. The procedure here are far less stringent, even though the consequences are far higher. Um, the government must only list the name of the organization in the schedule to the statute. There is a provision for, the re for a review committee to review these designations, but to my knowledge, this has never been set up. The punishment for being a member of a terrorist organization is imprisonment of up to 10 years. Um, during my fieldwork in Delhi's trial courts, I found, found that most terrorism trials taking place for, for, were for crimes of speech and for membership of a banned organization. Take, for example, the case of someone who I came to know called Yasin Patel Falahi. Falahi was the office bearer of the Students' Islamic Movement of India, that's SIMI, before it was both declared an unlawful association and a terrorist organization in 2001. Soon thereafter, the police arrested Falahi and charged him with sedition and membership of a terrorist organization and other hate speech related charges. The Delhi Police's Special Anti Terror Corps, known as the Special Cell, alleged that Falahi had put up a poster in a predominantly Muslim area of South Delhi at a busy intersection in broad daylight. Despite doing this, the police could produce no independent or public witnesses. The poster, and this is key, as described by in the prosecution's charge sheet, had a quote unquote anti national slogan to, quote, destroy nationalism, establish khilafat, that's um, ruled by Islamic principles, in big lettering, with a big fist of a, with a picture of a closed fist, crushing the flags of Russia, the USA, and India. After a trial that lasted several years and comprised of only police witnesses, Falahi was convicted of sedition and of membership of a terrorist organization. In a shoddily region's judgment, the trial court reasoned that this act of putting up a poster demonstrated that Falahi continued to be a member of a terrorist organization and sentenced him to five years imprisonment. Other members of SIMI have been charged for membership of a terrorist organization for different acts. These acts include the protesting of a burning of Quran, for possessing Islamic literature, some of which may have been published by SIMI prior to its banning, for loudly questioning the Indian sovereignty over Kashmir, to possessing or distributing audio recordings of Osama bin Laden. I want to emphasize that these are charges brought by the police. And in the vast majority of cases, we are not even sure if these speech acts were actually made or if they were made, if they would lead to, lead to convictions for membership, as there have been very few and almost no judgments. Further, SIMI members have been accused of committing acts of violence, but most cases brought against purported SIMI members pertain to speech and membership. This is not a pattern that pertains to SIMI alone. In another case that I followed during my fieldwork, two trade union activists were arrested and charged with being members of a banned communist party. According to the two people who I met in, Delhi's, in the Delhi courts, they were active in organizing workers in Delhi's unorganized sector. The special cell accused them of being members of the Communist Party of India Maoist. The police alleged that they had made speeches amongst workers of Delhi to instigate them to join the Maoist cause. The only evidence submitted by the prosecution in support of this char charge is a literature that was seized from, ostensibly seized from their homes, copies of Marxist literature and publication and pamphlets produced by communist organizations, not all of which were banned. In any event, it is not a crime to read or to possess literature that is, possessed, that is produced by banned organizations, but the police have regularly used the mere possession of such literature as evidence of a membership of a banned organization. The fact that most um, of the, the, the overwhelming majority of terrorism trials end in acquittal, and the conviction rate um, for a previous anti-terror statute was something like 0.04%, yet this is a little comfort. Apart from the fact that charges under anti-terror legislations are not aimed at obtaining a conviction, but as Indra um, Jai Singh said, they're used to detain people for as long as possible. The mere charges filed for speech and uh, membership cases serves to further justify the ban on organizations. In 2001, just after SIMI was banned for the first time, police around the country filed charges based on membership against SIMI members. These charges, and note they're not convictions since there were none, were used to argue for a subsequent ban on SIMI. According to the central government, the charges against accused individuals showed, that the, showed the continued existence of SIMI. Thus, charges against people for membership of SIMI justified a further ban on SIMI, which in turn justified and brought further membership charges. There's a self-fulfilling circularity 
between banning of organizations and bringing terrorism charges. Many of the more recent arrests under the UAP across India, from the Bhima Koregaon arrest in 2018 that Indra Jessing mentioned, to the protests against the recent Citizenship Amendment Act in 2019, to arrests of journalists such as Siddiq Kappan, for, who wanted a report on uh, gang rape in uh, Uttar Pradesh, have involved police accused of uh, accusing people of being members of terrorist organizations or being part of terrorist conspiracies solely based on speeches that they are purported to have made. For example, in the Bhima Koregaon event, the police complaint alleges that a theater troupe sang provocative songs, made seditious speeches, and com conducted dramatic readings and, quote, dance events with malice and enmity intentions. According to the police, the banned Maoist organization, CPI, has ha have, had an, have organized role to boast and implicate the strong Maoist thoughts in the depressed classes and misdirect or misguide them and turn them towards unconstitutional violent activities, end quote. It is abundantly clear that anti-terror -legisl legislation and the power to ban organizations pose a fundamental threat to both the freedom of association and the freedom of speech and expression. And I'd probably deviate from the title of the seminar to say it's not the abuse of uh, terrorism laws that makes that that targets freedom of, of speech and expression and fundamental human rights of Indians. It is their use, their existence, as Ritesh said, poses a fundamental challenge to rule of law and constitutionalism in India. Thank you very much. Thank you so much um, for that super concrete, um, you know, uh, uh, presentation that showed us exactly how um, how these anti-terror laws and and other weaponized laws are affecting um, individuals um, and organizations. Thank you so much. Our final speaker today is John Sifton, who is the Asia Advocacy Director at Human Rights Watch where he previously served as a senior researcher and deputy Washington director. He focuses on South and Southeast Asia. He started at Human Rights Watch in 2001 as a researcher on Afghanistan and South Asia, and later was the senior researcher on terrorism and counterterrorism. Previously, he worked for the International Rescue Committee, primarily in Afghanistan and Pakistan, and in 1999 on refugee issues in Albania and Kosovo. He holds a law degree from New York University School of Law and a bachelor's degree from St. John's College. And that's John, you have seven minutes. Thank you. Um, thank you for inviting me today. It's really an honor to be with these other panelists on this important topic. The timing of the hearing is important. Um, it's clear that in recent years, the government of India has been engaging in increasingly severe crackdowns on freedom of speech under the ruling BJP government. Um, they're now routinely responding to peaceful critics with abusive, excessive legal actions. And uh, the focus today is on anti-terrorism provisions, but the crackdown is broader, as several panelists have noted. Tax authorities and various regulators conducting arbitrary investigations as a form of harassment, police undertaking unjustified inquiries and raids based on complaints by BJP supporters, the allegations of sedition. Um, we could go on and on. Many of these laws and the, uh, some of the provisions of anti-terrorism laws were enacted under previous governments. Um, but as Human Rights Watch stated, when those laws were adopted, and we say again today, they don't comply with international norms or India's obligations under international human rights law, which is what I want to talk about today. Um, but, but make no mistake, the current government is using these pro provisions more aggressively to criminalize peaceful dissent and stifle press freedom and undermine rights to freedom and freedom of expression in peaceful assembly. So look, the focus is on the terrorism law, the Unlawful Activities Prevention Act, the UAPA. I'm gonna focus on how that law falls short of international human rights standards. Um, look, we can all acknowledge that governments have a responsibility to ensure public safety, but the current government is largely using the UAPA not to protect its citizens or national security, but rather to target human rights defenders, and journalists and critics of the government as well as members of marginalized groups, including Dalits, tribal communities, and religious minorities, in particular Muslims. Um, but in any case, regardless of their intentions, the government's intentions, 
and the subject matter of the cases they brought. Under international human rights law, counterterrorism legislation can't be as excessively broad and vaguely worded as the UAPA is. Uh, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, the ICCPR, to which India is a state party, outlines the fundamental due process and fair protection, protect, uh, fair trial protections that are applicable in all times in all countries that have signed that treaty, even during states of emergency. And as the UN Security Council, Resolution 1456 mentions in the context of counterterrorism legislation, measures the uh, counterterrorism measures that, that countries adopt um, must be must comply with their international obligations under human rights law. Well, India has failed in those regards under those standards, as Ms. Jasing just noted, um, and the other panelists talked about. Under the UAPA, terrorism is defined in an entirely vague and overbroad manner, encompassing a wide range of activities, including nonviolent activities, including political protests by minority populations and civil society groups. As Ms. Jasing noted, uh, the law criminalizes any act, quote, likely to threaten the unity, integrity, security, or sovereignty of India, or likely to cause even something relatively unterrifying, like the disruption of supplies or services central to the life of the community. These, let, let me underline Ms. Jason's point. This language is incredibly vague and overbroad and violates international human rights norms that I just cited. And indeed, any lawyer, not just a human rights lawyer, can see how open the language is. Beyond criminalizing violent acts, it criminalizes any act, any act or activity at all that might threaten India's unity or integrity. I mean, what are such acts? Reading a Bertolt Brecht poem? Engaging in any kind of criticism of the government? Is this briefing a violation of the law? Any activity at all that threatens India's unity, whatever the means are arguably uh, offends somebody somewhere in India is criminal potentially under the vagueness of this law. But it gets worse. The law also contains all of the major procedural problems that the other banks have mentioned. Ban on organization, uh, banning an organization, making membership of groups a criminal offense, conducting warrantless searches, seizures and arrests, compelling third parties to provide information without a court order, creating special courts with in-camera hearings, using secret wit witnesses and evidence. And, um, and most troublingly of all, the way the UAPA allows detention without charge for up to 180 days and creates a small presumption against bail and the presumption of guilt, as Ms. Jason mentioned. And as Dr. Hussein noted, the process becomes the punishment. Even if a charge is groundless, a defendant can automatically be held for half a year. So what I wanna emphasize here is that these are not domestic Indian law problems exclusively. They are, there are issues under the Indian constitution, which others know better than me, but these are also international human rights problems. And you don't need to take it from Human Rights Watch. On presumption of evidence, uh, on presumption of innocence, for instance, the United Nations High, uh, sorry, the United Nations Human Rights Committee, which monitors compliance with the ICCPR, has emphasized presumption of innocence is fundamental to the protection of human rights, imposes on the prosecution the burden of proving the charge beyond a reasonable doubt. Overbroad and vague language, criminalization of membership of a group. Well, in 2018, several United Nations Human rights experts express concerns over terrorism charges being used to silence human rights defenders. They said the UAP's vague definition of unlawful activities, membership of terrorist organizations, confers discretionary powers upon state agencies, which weakens judicial oversight and diminishes civil liberties. Then in May 2020, eight, eight, UN Special Rapporteurs and the working group, the UN Working Group on Arbitrary Detention, raised concerns with the Indian government about 2019 amendments to the UAP saying that, quote, the expansion of the designation of individuals as, quote, terrorists is problematic because the act fails to define a terrorist threat clearly 
and introduces broad discretion for the relevant authorities to label a person as a terrorist threat based on imprecise criteria. The eight rapporteurs also said they were concerned about the use of the law to conflate human rights and civil society activities with terrorist activities and the fair trial and due process problems we've just mentioned. They also, the eight UN social rapporteurs, said the law would broaden potential discrimination against religious and other minorities, as well as human rights defenders, and that it's being used to target certain civil society actors on political, religious, or other unjustified grounds. I raise all this in conclusion to make it clear to the US audience of policymakers in Washington, US government officials, whether in Congress or the administration, that they can't take from India a rebuttal that this is a domestic problem that will be sorted out by India on its own. India is now out of compliance with international human rights law. And US officials have the right of any UN member state to raise those issues, just as India has the right to raise the United States human rights record if it violates international human rights law, which we've said it does in other instances. So that's the important use for all of these international standards to allow US policymakers to avoid the trap that is laid for them by Indian government officials where they say, you can't criticize us because these are domestic issues. They are domestic issues, but they're also international human rights issues as well. And that is the avenue whereby congressional members and the administration can raise those issues. My recommendations are simple, that congressional members, and members of Congress, use whatever interactions they have with the Indian government to raise these issues and state that we're very troubled that India is, appears to be deteriorating. They can talk about the United States having its own deteriorating political environment if they want. The point is, it's something of concern and members of Congress should raise it. And then the other thing that US members of Congress should and can do is to pressure the administration to speak up more about this deteriorating situation, whether it's by the incoming ambassador when it, uh, he or she is chosen, or in interactions between the State Department or the NSA or any, during any kind of bilateral or multilateral meetings. There's no reason why two countries that have shared so much history and a democratic tradition cannot speak honestly with each other about the problems with human rights in the other country. It's, it's within the rights of the United States government to raise these issues and they should raise these issues with the government of India. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, John, for getting that global human rights perspective, but also, again, bringing it back to what we in the in outside India and um, the lawmakers in America in particular um, can do and should do. Um, really appreciate your being with us. Thank you, John. Um, I just want to add that this uh, trend of um, using laws and abusing laws to crush dissent is something that's spreading beyond India's borders. And people, those of us who are outside India and raising these issues are seeing whether it's um, trolls threatening to uh, file FIRs in India or actually filing them on um, uh, celebrities like Rihanna or activists like Reda Thunberg or lawsuits um, against some of us, even in this uh, event. Um, th this trend is spreading. And so that's another reason why um, those of us abroad and lawmakers in the States should understand that this is not just an Indian issue. Um, so thank you. And now at the end, as promised, we have recorded remarks from Safura Zargar, the Muslim youth leader from India who was arrested um, under the UAPA last year and has been made an accused on totally false charges. She was eventually given bail from painstaking defense work by Ritesh Dubey, who we just heard from. And after her case gained international attention, thanks to efforts by Fadis Hussain and John Sifton and many others. And so if um, Mudassir Bhai, if you could play the video, that would be great. A very good afternoon to all present. I am Safura Zerger, and I am pursuing MPhil from Jamia Minya Islam. I am best known for my participation in the anti-CEA protest and subsequent unlawful arrest under the UAPA. 
the dreaded and draconian unlawful preventive activities prevention act in india which puts the onus of proving innocence on the accused that is me that means that when i was arrested i was presumed guilty as opposed to the innocent until proven guilty principle of the indian jurisprudence the anti caa protests sparked off in december 2019 when the parliament of india unconstitutionally passed the citizenship amendment act which when read with the nrc can and will render citizens of india many citizens of india stateless and thus create a grave humanitarian crisis in but at the time i was protesting against this act little did i know that in the midst of a global pandemic when our country will go into a nationwide lockdown i will be booked under the most draconian of laws in india the uapa as punishment for voicing my concerns against a discriminating and discriminatory and unconstitutional act on the 10th of april 2020 while i was sleeping in my house a team of jail police special cell knocked on my door 15 minutes later arrested my in-laws and husband informed them, them that i was pregnant and needed rest i was not issued any notice for joining the investigation was not even called for an interrogation even once i was simply arrested without informing me that i was being arrested without an arrest memo i was taken to the delhi police special cell where i was interrogated my phone was seized without a seizure warrant I was told at 10:30 p.m. in the night that I was being arrested, and my husband was made to sign an arrest memo that falsely timed my arrest at 5:30 p.m. All due process of law was bypassed in my case. I was not even informed why I was being arrested and the charges against me. At 11 p.m. in the night, I was asked to sit in the police jeep with seven police persons, only one of them a woman constable. I was taken to another police station in Jafarabad, which had no women in it. Where I was told to sleep on the floor. I was then produced in front of the magistrate at noon the next day, where I finally met with my lawyers, who had to really struggle to get access to me. I was remanded to police custody for three days in the Jafarabad police station. All three days, I have slept in different police stations. The conditions of these police cells were not even fit for animals, leave alone humans. After my uh, police custody was over, I was maliciously arrested in another FIR with more serious charges and handed back to the Delhi Police Special Cell for an additional two days of police remand. This was done solely to keep me in unlawful custody. After that, I was remanded to judicial custody and sent to Tihar jail. On the day of my production, I was denied access to my lawyers, deliberately were misinforming them about my place of production. Only to bypass all due process of law and punish me for such a thing. On the 19th of April, after my lawyers filed for bail and the matter was being heard, the police invoked the UAP in the case. And bail was not only denied, but all hope for a bail was lost because in UAP cases, the norm is no bail. Due to a fierce legal battle and an intense media campaign, I was able to secure bail in 74 days, the first in a UAP case. it was only because of the wide set the wide spread support that i had received not just in india but all over the world and the hard work and diligence of my lawyers who leave no stone unturned despite being faced with hopeless circumstances coupled with the fact that the prosecution could not have produced an iota of proof to support even one of their allegations and charges against me the case against me is so weak and frivolous that the prosecution was aware that it will not stand in the court of law and hence to avoid arguing the merits of the case it decided to bypass it and concede it on the merits thankfully it has sparked a serious debate on the UAPA under which the conviction rate is only 2.2% but all those who are charged with the law spend years and years in jail before finally being acquitted no reparations have ever been made to any of them In the recent years, the use of UAP to stifle dissent and gag the press in India has reached unprecedented levels. The international community cannot stand mute to the grave human rights violations happening under the garb of an anti-terror law. Today, I thank all the people who have made this congressional briefing possible and urge the congressmen to unconditionally and unequivocally renounce this draconian law. The UAP must go. Reparations must be made to all those maliciously prosecuted. The security agencies must be held criminally accountable for misuse of power and malicious prosecution. Thank you.
That was incredibly inspiring. And um, while our hearts go out to everybody that is unfairly languishing behind bars right now, I am so glad and we are so glad that you, Safura, are at least out. Um, out to be safe, but also out to keep speaking, keep speaking the truth. Thank you so much. Um, at this point, we can take a few questions before concluding. We're gonna go beyond the hour, we're already beyond the hour. So let me take a look in the Q&A. Um, we can, let me, um, I can only take a few. So we have the first question um, is from Mr. Tom McCausland, um, who asks, let me see, how is it ever defensible that murderous Hindutva um, uh, fascists, including those in the Indian government, police, and army, who slaughter innocents in the name of their radical Hindutva ideology, can never by definition be classed to be terrorists, let alone that they are even actually prosecuted or convicted for their acts. So it's a question about um, the fact that those who are accusing others of terrorism are um, guilty of it themselves. Uh, so I don't know if any, it wasn't directed to any one of you, but perhaps some, um, does anyone want to volunteer to answer that? Maybe Ritesh, since you're in India. Well, thank you for this. I've been ambushed second time today. Uh, this question is actually loaded in, uh, I mean, for me, I see this question very loaded because this actually tries to justify that terrorism should, uh, should be allowed to sustain in the law books. And the only problem is who is using it. Uh, while, of, of course, the murderous Hindus, Hindutva fascists, which are consistently uh, using uh, and com have, have committed acts which are uh, of costly nature, but uh, I see some hope, like when I saw the judgment uh, of Justice Murli Dhar in the Hashimpura case, where the people who committed the, where the police personnel who uh, shot uh, 41 uh, Muslims uh, point blank uh, after taking them up, uh, they actually, th those people were actually convicted and sentenced and tried. So we don't actually need laws like UAPA or any other such laws to, uh, you know, make sure that people who do actually commit crimes and are actually punished. We only need uh, uh, good lawyers, not good actually, we need lawyers who, who just remember what they were taught in the law school. Uh, because when I was in the law school, uh, I mean, try to follow what my teachers taught me. So we need lawyers, we need judges who also remember what was taught to them in the law schools and uh, just follow that. Because I, 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 I actually refuse to believe that any judge uh, in, at the Supreme Court or at the high court level at least has anything to fear from any government anywhere. It's a constitutional court. I mean, you are a constitutional authority. What do you have to fear now, except for your life? I mean, I'm, thank so, you. Uh, so, I, to, my, uh, my answer to him would be that there are there are enough things in the law to uh, kind of hold those people accountable, but let's not get carried away and try to defend uh, laws like UAP on those charges. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you. And um, both John and Mayur have something to add to this, but Mayur, you can go first, but I'll also tell you a second question so you can maybe combine your response. Um, Reverend Peter Cook asks, does this anti-terrorism law also influence decisions about who will be granted FCRA under the FCRA new rules? Um, so thank you. I just wanted to uh, thank you for the questions. Um, I just wanted to echo what Ritesh said about the fact that, fact that uh, for, regarding the first question, um, that in the fact that you don't need a terrorism law to deal with 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 acts effectively of what's a genocide, right? So the I think there's an Indian campaign against for the genocide uh, for a genocide for for the international committee, um, criminal court, which is basically as proposing um, a genocide law. So we can that's a different discussion. But you, the only thing that a, that an anti-terrorism law does, it allows police to keep you in ba without bail, pre-charge and during the trial for years, if not decades. That's the only thing it does. Right. So the, the content is almost it's it, it, the, because the content is so broad, you can bring anything under the anti-terror law. Right. So we don't need an anti-terror law. And there's another question I saw there saying, is the IPC enough? Yes, it is enough. 
if you if you look at the big um, terrorism cases such as the de- um, the parliament attack case the evidence obtained under the terrorism law was thrown out right it was thrown out and they used the normal indian uh, um the indian evidence act evidence right so you don't we don't need an anti terror law um regarding the fcra question i'm not sure how much is taken to an account i'm sure um indra ji probably a better answer to this um but i can imagine that um the discourse of terrorism will definitely impact on who um is actually given an fcra license thank you thank you mayor um i didn't realize indra ji singh was still with us um indra ji do you have anything to add um to what has already been said we can't hear you you're you're on mute I do I do agree with the previous speakers that there is no need for an anti terror law however we do have still on our statute books laws like sedition which as i said earlier has no place in a republican form of government that needs to go as well though it's part of the indian ordinary criminal indian procedure code and the other law which i think you see i wanted to make one point normally we say these laws are being abused and a, a speaker on this program did point out it's not that they are being abused they are being used but apart from that when abuse becomes a policy it becomes unconstitutional and therefore i think laws like the uapa can be declared unconstitutional very often because they are selectively used against minority communities i don't think we can ignore that and secondly they get abused to put silent dissenters and that i think is a good enough reason to declare these laws unconstitutional apart from the fact that they are overbroad and vague which are grounds for unconstitutionality so the sedition law needs to go and also the other one which are pointed out causing communal disharmony that it's a bit of a joke that when a minority community organizes against the oppression of the majority community they are told that they are disrupting communal harmony that section also needs to go because the understanding of that section is you cannot claim your rights the minute you raise your heads and claim your rights and you happen to belong to a minority community whether you're a dalit or whether you're a muslim but you demand your rights you are told you are disrupting communal harmony because all of us the oppressors and oppressed are supposed to live in harmony with each other this these laws just have to go out of the window Thank you. Thank you Indraji. I know John has been waiting to weigh in as well. Um but I'll just add one more question that was directed to you. Um in the absence of legal certainty is sorry, the absence of legal certainty a constant feature of most terror based terror based law across the world. Well, look, I guess we'll answer this in the simplest way I can. Um We've had a counterterrorism program at Human Rights Watch for well over a decade now. And the enduring thing we say in all the countries we work in, all over the world, from Chile to Egypt to India and beyond, is that often the last thing you need is more legislation. And it's often times somewhat ironic to consider the fact that anybody would think that flying an airplane into a set of buildings or storming a hotel in Mumbai with guns and killing people is not already criminal under basic criminal law what is the purpose of these laws these counterterrorism laws it's often to make the procedural hurdles easier for the police easier for them to use secret evidence tainted evidence easier for them to hold people without charge things like that so the last thing we need to do is start saying that more people are you know guilty of terrorism we face a similar situation here in the united states where we have a growing number of right wing or white supremacist groups engaging in violent activity or threats and there's you know some talk among some people to make these things into to have these people investigated under terrorism laws 
we say to ourselves, these are necessary approaches. There are laws that criminalize threatening somebody, being violent, storming the Capitol, the US Congress. These are already illegal under basic criminal law. So we don't need um, more aggressive counterterrorism legislation here or anywhere else. I wanna just end by saying the hearing today is about India, but you know, in February, we put out a report about how there is a broad trend in dozens of countries around the world to increasingly criminalize free speech activity using counterterrorism laws, public safety laws, religious harmony laws, and so on. Uh, Ms. Jason just mentioned um, communal harmony. There was a doctor, an oncologist in India who was investigated uh, for criticizing responses to COVID-19. That's part of a broader pattern across the world of governments abusing laws to criminalize defense to go after anybody who criticizes their response to COVID. And some countries, not India, have used terrorism laws. Egypt, for instance, used a terrorism law to go after medical staff who were critical of the Egyptian government's response. So while we focus should be on India and US policymakers pressing India, recognize that India also plays a role in lowering the bar worldwide and that you know, other countries look to India, especially in the region, from Nepal to Sri Lanka to Bangladesh, and often model their laws on India's laws. And if India lowers their bar, it will contribute to a lowering of a bar in other places as well. I just want to put that on a broader regional and international perspective. Thank you. Thank you. We'll need to um, close, but I, I'll, what I'll do is I'll read out this last question that's in the Q&A, and maybe we can hear from Vadis because we haven't heard from you in the, in the roundup. And then if any of the rest of the speakers have any closing thoughts, we'll make a couple of minutes and then I will close this, um, this briefing. So the question is um, from Ashim Jain. The problem appears to be in the law or constitution, but it is rooted in the beliefs, values, and even the culture of the people. And it's not limited to India, but there is a parallel even in US of people who support white supremacy, which brought, which brought Donald Trump into power. Um, John has been echoing this kind of um, thinking. Thus, the people's mindsets have to be changed with enlightenment about freedom, independence, rights, responsibility, equality, et cetera. So it's more about um, changing the hearts and minds of people. So Vadis, if you can um, take that, and then if anybody else wants to chime in with closing comment, very quick, if possible. Yeah, I'm perhaps the least qualified to make this answer because I'm a lawyer. So I look at everything as a legal lens and I don't see it as a social lens. So I, I just have to be caveat to say that I've spent like 10 years of school just focusing on how to solve problems through a legal lens. So I'm not, I'm not equipped for that. I do though think, um, this goes to a more wider picture, not just about communalism or not white nationalism or Hindutva nationalism, nationalism, generally speaking, but the terrorism laws, right, in a post 9-11 era, globally, have tried to categorize or put into a different legal paradigm terrorism and to dispense with all of the rights that we usually have under criminal trials, right? So I think what John was saying and what I want to really emphasize here is counterterrorism laws across the world, and India is uh, part of that sort of trend, right? Um, do try and treat terrorism as a small war rather than a big crime. It's a big crime. It's a crime. Yes, people die. You have uh, the IPC, you have the penal codes of India that can prosecute free people for murder, et cetera, et cetera, all the crimes that are recognized. But when you put it into the category of a small war, you dispense with all the civil liberties that you have attached to criminal processes, to the right to fair trial, to the right to see the evidence that's being presented against you. All of those are dispensed with because we're in, we're in small war land. We're not in big crime land. I would emphasize to everyone on this call, um, and I'm not sure if uh, Indraji and Ritesh would agree, but we should think of these as, as big crimes. Yes, the terrorism can be a big crime, right? And how we define terrorism has to be narrowly tailored, but we must use the things that we have as protections for civil liberties, regardless of if it's terrorism or if it's a general crime, it's a big crime. So we should prosecute it like a big crime um, and not put it into this legal weird vacuum where we've dispensed with all of the rights that are guaranteed for fair trial for people because we're treating it as, as if it's some kind of act of war when they're consistently happening. And the definition of terrorism has to change over time. So I didn't answer Mr. Jane's question. I think that he's right. There is a lot of community building that has to happen, coalition building that has to happen, changing the minds of people who are supportive of these repressive regimes. Yes, agreed. 
from the legal lens, and of course I'm biased towards all solutions being through a legal lens, uh, I think that we need to think about this, this paradigm of big crime versus small war as a very important definitional place for us to move forward past the post 9-11 uh, anti-terrorism law uh, regimes that we've had across the world. And by the way, this is a very common problem amongst all, all common law nations. The British had set up all of these overarching laws in their colonial rule. Now we're reviving them in this terrorism age um, in Pakistan, in India, in Bangladesh, we're seeing it everywhere. Um, so there is like a history for this and that's not a great history and perhaps we should move away from that history because it doesn't really recognize the autonomy, the sovereignty, the human rights of people. It looks at them as colonial subjects the same way that the British did. And that's what I would sort of end on, um, that this, these are vestiges of the colonialist past and the legal regimes that were set up uh, by the British as well. Thank you, Varis. Um, I, I should say that um, because a lot of these atrocities are ostensibly mm -hmm. happening in the name of Hinduism, um, uh, Hindu, Hindutva, this aberration of Hinduism, we in Hindus for Human Rights um, spend all our days trying to change the hearts and minds of Hindus and wake them up to the atrocities that are taking place. And you can learn about us at hindusforhumanrights.org. Um, I invite our speakers to give under one minute wrap ups if you want to, before I wrap up. Anybody? I'll dispense with mine since I think I, that, that last minute was my wrap up. Anyone? Indraji, do you have anything more to share with us? Um, I agree, it's a definitional issue. Yeah, how do you define? Uh, and, and, you know, uh, I'd like to say that yes, changing the hearts and minds of people is possible. And as you rightly point out, you're, you're doing it, but I'm sorry, I don't believe it's possible to change the hearts and minds of those who are in positions of power in the state. They enjoy impunity and that impunity has to be dismantled. So it's accountability that we look for when it comes to the police, to the prosecution, to our governments. It's hearts and minds when we, that we look for when we deal with civil society. That's all I want to say. Thank you, Indiraji. So it come, it's time now to thank our partners um, who made this uh, event possible. First of all, to thank all of you who attended this congressional briefing. Our esteemed speakers have appeared at this briefing with enormous courage, despite the threats of retaliation by a vindictive Indian government. And our groups who put this event together also face a lot of attacks all the time. I thank our partners, Govind Acharya of Amnesty International USA, Trent Martin of 21 Wilberforce, Rashid Ahmed of Indian American Muslim Council, Hina Zubedi of Justice for All, Matias Pertula of International Christian Concern, Peter Cook of the New York State Council of Churches, Sydney Cochin of Jubilee Campaign, Roja Singh of Dalit Solidarity Forum, Ambassador Islam Siddiqui of American Muslim Institution, John Prabudas of the Federation of Indian American Christian Organizations of North America, Kalim Kwaja of Association of Indian Muslims of America, Dr. Rehan Khan of International Society for Peace and Justice, Partha Chakrabarti of India Civil Watch International, and Mike Gauss of Center for Pluralism, and my, my team at Hindus for Human Rights. The 16 organizations that have put together today's discussion will bring you the next congressional briefing two Wednesdays from now on July 14th. The title of that briefing is Religious Freedom in India, Challenges and Opportunities. I thank you all and I hope to see you the next time.